I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Shanna Tellerman, who's come all the way over from Silicon Valley. And Shanna was just saying that she thought when she came that she would have a weekend of sightseeing Scotland and, and getting some of the atmosphere of Scotland. Little did she know she was going to be so taken up with talks and all the rest of it. Um, so Shanna's a founder and CEO of Wild Pockets, um, a company that she set up, or a, an idea and a project that she set up while she was over at Carnegie Mellon and spun out from that and she's going to talk about being an accidental entrepreneur which I really like um, and the vision for her Wild Pockets game platform. So thank you Shanna. Great, thank you. <laughs> so first of all I just want to thank um, everybody who's involved with Girl Geeks. Uh, it is just a really incredible opportunity to be here and to be meeting everybody here. Uh, I've had, I've been blown away and I actually feel like I could easily be sitting in the audience <laughs> right now learning from all of you. Um, so to start off, I thought I'd ask how many people here are thinking about entrepreneurship, starting a company in some manner? <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> and how many people are right now a little bit sort of uncertain of how you would get started doing something of that sort? <laughs> Maybe a little bit intimidated by the process. <laughs> um, so I suppose if there's one message to take away from tonight and that I want you to take away, it's that it's way more accessible than you think. And you uh, should go for it, and do it, and start it immediately. Um, nothing's holding you back. Uh, so I've kind of split my talk into two pieces tonight. Um, a little bit about how I ended up getting started and starting this company, and a little bit about the product as well that we're building Wild Pockets. So just to get started, actually, Relevant to our last talk, my background is not what you might think for an entrepreneur. No business experience, and also no technology experience. So um, the world of starting a game company was sort of really out of my realm when I, uh, when I ended up going to uh, college. And definitely, of all the things I imagine myself doing, this was not one in my future path. Um, so my, uh, my initial background is actually in painting and drawing and traditional arts. and. Uh, and I spent you know, lots and lots of time kind of in studios and around canvases and you know, thinking about kind of more of just the fine arts, the tra traditional arts, and uh, ended up kind of seeing the computer lags at Carnegie Mellon and wondering kind of you know, what's going on in there, but not really engaging until I um, you know, took a couple of maybe Photoshop classes and Flash classes, but nothing too hardcore. Um, and then I really, my last year was kind of this revelation for me. I took this course called Building Virtual Worlds. And this is my senior year in college and you know, already thinking I'm going to go into the arts field and maybe work with an art dealer in New York and kind of a whole different life than where I ended up. Um, but I took this course and it was just mind-blowing for me. I took this class that was about you know, interdisciplinary teams working in these two and three week iterations. And there'd be you know, an artist, a programmer, maybe a sound designer on the team. We'd have two weeks. And at the end of those two weeks, we had a total virtual reality, like the headsets that you wear, um, you know, sensors in your hands, experience that we had built. And we'd have a naive user come in. So somebody just you know, randomly who'd not seen any of this in creation, who had to get into this virtual reality environment and actually interact in it. So everything had to be working. There had to be interfaces. You know, if it, blew up and didn't work at all, then we basically you know, failed that, <laughs> that project. Um, so this was to me was just like the most fascinating thing I'd ever done and the most fun thing I'd ever done. We spent like 24 hours straight for two weeks you know, working on this. <laughs> and in the end, you had created something with this team that you barely knew ahead of time. Um, and it was you know, these experiences that you'd never have dreamed of ahead of time. So at that point, I was like, this is, this is what I want to do. I don't know what I want to do with it, but I want to know I wanted to go into this field. Um, so I went into a program at Carnegie Mellon called the Entertainment Technology Center. I'm not sure if anybody here has ever heard of this program, but it was pretty novel at Carnegie Mellon. It was this, uh, this interdisciplinary program between the Computer Science School and the Fine Arts School. And what you did during this program is really worked on real world projects for two years with real customers and real applications. Um, and I know in Dundee they actually have some similar programs around gaming. Um, so I started this not quite knowing, again, what I was going to do with it, but just knowing it was a fascinating field and actually kind of relevant to your work as well. I, uh, my very first semester I worked on something around how you use improvisational techniques, acting techniques, in massively multiplayer online games to create uh, unexpected narratives and storytelling. 
Um, and it was kind of this like very strange approach and everybody was like, that's a very weird project <laughs> in the gaming space, you know, and especially on the sort of more traditional theater side, they were like, like what games and theater and now I think it's becoming more accepted um, and I think that is the future of kind of these spaces being used for all kinds of novel purposes. Um, so by my second semester and it's a two-year program so you have four semesters, I ended up working on a technology that ultimately formed the basis of the company. I had no idea at that point that that was you know what I was getting myself into um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that project uh, and then between those two years I spent some time working at Electronic Arts and I worked on uh, The Sims 2 and it was really an awesome experience there was like a 250 person team I saw what sort of the height of the industry was doing and amazingly talented and smart people um, that I was working with and I thought all summer long like you could actually graduate and you could be working there. So I thought, I'm going to spend my last year, I'm going to get paid, I'm going to work on a real team, and I'm going to graduate with a master's. This is like a very good deal. Um, and one day I woke up and it was right after this brainstorming session. So we went into this brainstorming session, they pulled together you know, all of these uh, students and interns and sort of you know, the younger sort of fresh people who were working on The Sims and said, we want to envision what the future of The Sims could be like. Um, and you know what the future of this could be and I think it was after that brainstorming session that I realized while there were so many great ideas put on the boards and you know kind of put out there I knew that it was going to be you know a long long time if ever before these ideas came to fruition because it's a big team there's a lot of decision makers it's a giant company and they have you know shareholders and other you know IP that they need to be thinking about and I was sitting there going I want to run with these ideas like today <laughs> so that was sort of the point where I was like, okay, I think I'm going to go back to the university for the last year because I'd like to work on things where I really can just affect them immediately. Um, so I continued this project that I had started the first year, and that was kind of you know, unusual. They sometimes put one student to continue the same project um, and ended up spending the full year working on the same project and actually ended up hired by the university at the end because this project had sort of spun up to be something, and I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. Um, two other projects just worth mentioning and sort of a passion of mine is how you use entertainment um, for educational um, and other kinds of uh, opportunities. So how do these virtual environments and spaces and sort of 3D technologies, how do they encourage you know, training, education? ALICE is a program uh, that was started at Carnegie Mellon that is geared towards middle school girls and it's, it uses 3D interactive environments to sort of subtly teach them how to program. And they do that by storytelling. So they come up with stories and they learn to tell stories through Alice and create these very cool animations. Um, but meanwhile, they're learning the basics of programming and it's really a very novel use of it. They actually now have the Sims characters in there. Um, and another one, Project Listen, was something that I worked on for a little bit and really incredible. Um, it was you know, voice recognition technologies and using it to teach kids how to read in schools. So these were just some of the things that I got to play around with in the university. But the one that I ended up really working and spending a lot of time on, and very different than where we are today, uh, was something called, actually initially Biohazard. We renamed it when I started working on it to Hazmat Hot Zone. And it was focused on using a, a 3D virtual environment to simulate a real world emergency scenario. And we use that, these environments because generally, if you're a firefighter or an emergency responder, um, you're going to either sit in a classroom and listen to you know, PowerPoint lecture after PowerPoint lecture, maybe boring videos, or you know, the optimal training is real life training where you get in there and you've got your gear on and you're kind of life training, but they're expensive to put on, time consuming, and oftentimes really dangerous. Um, and sometimes you can't do them in environments you have access to. Like in New York, for example, the New York Fire Department could not get access to the subway anytime it wanted to. Um, so we were using gaming environments to simulate these kinds of real world training environments uh, because obviously with the immersion and sort of the realistic graphics you could get the feeling of being there. We could do it networked and multiple people could be in an environment together um, and they could talk together and they could have that kind of same experience, that training experience of the teamwork that goes on in a real life scenario. So it was pretty incredible use of this gaming technology and I was so blown away by like this totally outside, you know, your usual thought about how you might apply game technologies, 
but it was this great demographic. Most of the you know, emergency responders, especially in the New York Fire Department, especially when we were working on this in 2003, 2004, they were really young because it was right after 9-11. They had lost a lot of their department. Um, and they all played games in their spare time. And they had a lot of spare time because they'd be down and they'd be you know, sitting in the firehouses and doing other things. So this was this perfect use of it. And what we did was something a bit novel in that space, which is we said, let's provide a level editor or an environment that lets the instructor actually customize and tweak that training environment. Because we don't know what they should be training for, and it's always going to be slightly different. But we want to give them the means with which to create these simulated environments, even though none of them are game creators. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of what you'll see sort of if it's translated into wild pockets. We wanted to give accessibility to this medium of 3D technologies and the speed of creation uh, to 3D technologies to people who today might not have access to it. And we wanted them to be able to create really, really high quality and fantastic content um, and then easily distribute it and get it out there for purposes. Um, so that was the beginning of our company, SimOps, SimOps Studios. And uh, a little bit about kind of how I formed it um, and a lot about sort of the challenges is kind of what I want to um, talk about tonight. So for those who are thinking about kind of an entrepreneurial path, I think the biggest lesson learned is that I went into this you know, totally blind. I had no idea <laughs> what I was doing. And with kind of the right, you know, with both the right passion, you know, really caring about your idea, as well as um, using outside resources and learning from your mistakes, you can find your path there. There's no one right path there. Um, so our earliest kind of, you know, formation, we started this company because there's kind of two options. One is in the university, look at a grant. And the grant cycle, I had six months. And there was just no way that me with no grant writing experience and not too much support was going to apply for and you know, get a grant into the university to finish this project. It just wasn't speedy enough. And I was really eager to kind of make this thing happen. Um, and the other opportunity was we had talked to an investor. And we said, Commercial commercialization seems like a pretty you know, realistic and potential path to go. And why not? <laughs> so. The investor, there was an interested investor, and this investor was kind of thinking, you know, they would introduce us to various people. We were talking about a couple million dollars. We were talking about, you know, bringing in a CEO, a lot of, you know, things that ultimately never happened. Um, <laughs> and that was a big lesson early on, is nothing ever ends up happening the way you think it's going to happen. Um, so we started the company thinking, you know, investor's going to come in, bring in a couple million dollars. I'm going to focus on the product. The CEO is going to build the business. Um, and you know, within a couple of weeks, it just turned out this investment scenario was really not turning out to make a lot of sense. And the CEO candidate we're talking to, not somebody who really knew the industry and wasn't going to be a good fit. And so you know, we incorporated January 2006. By February or so, I'm there going, huh, no investor, no CEO. Looks like I'm running this company and trying to figure out an alternative funding plan. <laughs> So yeah, so it was kind of back to square one a little bit. Um, and we got a contract, luckily, right about the same time, small contract. And it gave me kind of the bandwidth to negotiate a, um, a license with Carnegie Mellon University, as well as bring in my first kind of employees, although they were contract employees at that point, um, and work on something not related to the product, but sort of start to get a sense of running a company. Uh, and by the summer, we had closed on the licensing agreement with CMU. And I had been talking to, for several months, an economic development fund um, who ended up closing. We closed on our first seed funding at that point. And this economic development fund is really what you know, kind of got us started and off the ground. But we went from a couple million dollars to about $100,000. <laughs> so our plans had to change pretty dramatically. Um, so I'm going to touch on pretty quickly some of the things that you know I went through and mistakes I made very early on. And I think even just you know by being here and taking notes, even you're already one step ahead of where I was when I was getting started with the company. Um, so the first one was around the product. Uh, so we had built this on something called uh, the Unreal Engine, and the Unreal Engine is an incredible commercial technology. Um, the problem is is that the cost of the Unreal Engine, especially at that point was a million dollars to use it commercially. And we had $100,000. So <laughs> we were kind of <laughs> in square one again, like, 
wow, okay, what are we doing? We've got this prototype and now we've got to build it in something that we can afford. And actually, we want to pay zero <laughs> for it because I have lots of other things I need to pay for besides just the technology to build on. Um, so we looked for open source engine. Um, other things around the product was just simply real reality. Emergency response departments, they didn't have, you know, network simulation, sort of, you know, high-tech computer infrastructure, right? Like most of them had five-year-old plus machines, <laughs> one, <laughs> sitting in their fire department. So we're looking for a technology that can run on their five-year-old machines and probably just a single player experience, not a networked multiplayer simulation and something more like a PowerPoint that's immersive. Um, so our product was just changing in all these ways and you know we're designing it and we also said well we've got a hundred thousand dollars so we've got to be able to build something with the team we have with you know in a limited amount of time at least get to a first milestone or be able to raise some more capital um, and actually have something functional. Um, so those became all of our requirements so I think you know one lesson is think think about lots of different potential scenarios for your products. Think about little kind of prototypes and milestones you can hit as well as wide large ones. Um, on the funding side, I think a lesson that I learned very early on and has continued for four years is you just never know really how much money you're going to be able to raise at any given point. So you think you're going to hit this next milestone and at that point you should be able to raise the Series A and then a Series B and more money and will come in if you know you're showing this progress. And then something like, you know, the financial climate changes incredibly <laughs> and people aren't investing in companies. So you need to always have multiple plans. So multiple plans for what would I do ideally to hit all of the milestones I want to hit and what would I do with 100k and what would I do with $50 and <laughs> what would I do if somebody gave me $10 tomorrow? <laughs> what would I buy? Um, all of that has to be kind of in your mind and you need to be flexible and ready to kind of roll with what the funding climate looks like. Um, CEO is something uh, that's been quite interesting for us as well. So I started this thinking we'd hire a CEO and I was going to focus on the product and that hasn't happened for four years. Um, but we're still talking about bringing in a CEO and we still very well might bring in a CEO. And I think the key thing that I've learned is being flexible to that has actually been a big advantage. So I always thought there was one coming in, but at the same time, I've really enjoyed running the company and I've sort of been learning and, and it's been something that I've been comfortable taking on the responsibility for. And I think actually that's been kind of an advantage. So a lot of investors, they don't want to invest in a company where somebody's like, I'm going to be the CEO and nobody's ever going to replace me, especially if you're coming from the tech side. Um, generally, you know, they want the flexibility to put somebody in. But at the same time, they may very well see something in you and want you to lead the company. And oftentimes early on in a tech company, the technical founder is somebody who's very good to be founding and running the company and may take it the whole way. So I think just staying open-minded is a really good place to be in terms of CEO. Um, the market size was really, this is probably our biggest lesson learned. So you'll see that we don't obviously address only the emergency responder market anymore. We address gaming really as our target segment now. Um, and I think there's kind of two pieces to this. One is we didn't really think about sort of what is the big growing market and what's the market that, um, that this could apply to potentially because we wanted to sort of stay focused and niche and it was a little bit scary this idea that this could be a much bigger idea. But at the same time, if you're building something and you really want sort of a large vision for it, you do have to be thinking about kind of what is the high growth market and what is the future potential for this and you need to cho choose a focus within that but that focus should be the area that's growing rapidly, not an area that's going to be sort of struggling to ever make a dollar for you. Um, so emergency response training, education, and what we're doing is absolutely still a segment of it and incredibly important. But it's probably not the place that we're going to see our sh first traction. They're not the earliest adopters. They're not the ones with sort of the biggest dollars to spend on these kinds of technologies. Um, they're not as experimental. So. Choosing that as a first market was, you know, was kind of a difficult entry point. And then as we sort of expanded our mind and thought, wow, we're building easy, accessible 3D technologies, this has a pretty large market opportunity in multiple industries, then it became pretty clear that there's some pieces of that, games perhaps, that are moving very, very fast and lots of early adopters and lots of people willing to experiment and using these kinds of technologies today. Um, last piece is around experience. So, no, I think my message is anybody can do this and you should, you should go do it. And um, it's, you know, the experience you gain from it is incredible. Like nothing that I could have gotten from anything else in life. Um, 
But at the same time, finding experienced people has been something so important along the whole way for me. So when I first started up finding a really great advisor, um, and then actually once I moved into Silicon Valley full time, there's just some people there who have started company after company or worked with company after company. And even though I don't have the experience, I'm able to go to them and say, you know, what did you do in this scenario? How does this work? Or, you know, how should we structure this piece? And, you know, they're able to tell me from their experience or point me to somebody who has that experience. So I'm able to kind of suck it in um, from people who've been there and done that. And I think that's a really key thing, finding somebody who's got the experience of what you're going after. So quick touch on this piece, um, Pittsburgh versus Silicon Valley. Uh, so Pittsburgh, um, actually I feel even slightly less so than Scotland and uh, the places I've been here, is really removed from sort of that tech hub and sort of touch into Silicon Valley and even that entrepreneurial spirit. You know, it's a little, it's a little more uncomfortable. A lot of people want to go into more comfortable traditional jobs. Um, so the idea that you're starting a company is a little more like, why would you do that? <laughs> you could go get a paying job. Um, and that's really hard. <laughs> and then there's not as many investors, and especially when you're looking at kind of new tech and gaming, and then especially, you know, if you're a young founder who's coming right out of school, it was a little bit, you know, it's a little less usual. Um, not that there's not things happening there, it's just wasn't like being in Silicon Valley where every, you know, 25 year old is starting a company. <laughs> you know, you meet them around, like turn the corner and somebody's like, I've got a company idea. Um, and it's very usual. So it just was a big contrast. So my quick list of advantages and disadvantages, uh, Pittsburgh was fantastic to start in because we had amazing, amazing people, really talented, really smart, um, so much less expensive to start there. Like I think our team right now would be about a third the size if we were trying to run it in the Valley. Um, also just a loyal, dedicated team, so not people who are looking for the next opportunity every year. Um, and a little outside of the bubble is a good thing sometimes. You know, you get some grounding in what the rest of the world is doing. <laughs> in Silicon Valley, everybody's making an iPhone app right now. I promise, everybody. Um, <laughs> and even people who, like, didn't even know, you know, don't even own an iPhone, they're making iPhone apps. Um, but in Silicon Valley, at the same time, you've got this wealth of experience of people who have started companies and an infrastructure in place. So what I found is uh, I moved there two years ago, and I moved there because purely because of numbers. There was numbers in terms of experience, numbers in terms of investment, and you know when you're looking to raise funds, you'd rather have more people to talk to than less people to talk to. Higher chance that you're going to end up raising money, um, and especially you want people who are investing in your company who have invested in this field or similar fields before who can help you grow the company and connect you to people. Um, everything from partners to you know, potential employees to other investors to advisors. And that's what I found when I moved there. Um, so my kind of, you know, if I was to think about doing it again, what would I do? I would probably start the prototype and get a company up and running outside of Silicon Valley because it's a lot cheaper. Or, you know, do it kind of in our basements right there. Um, and then make sure that I had some established connection in there when I became wanted to go to the next level. And that might be an advisor, that might be an investor, it doesn't have to be that your founder or your CEO is in Silicon Valley, um, but it's really helpful to have that tap in there just because that network they'll provide you just can help grow the company much more quickly. And I'm gonna move a little more quickly because we'll move into the product as the second half. Um, so this is my quick list of top recommendations. If I was going to go back and, again, like do this again, what would I be telling myself? <laughs> kind of my short list. Um, first one is start today. Like don't, you know, don't kind of think about it and you know, think you have to get it all perfectly figured out and right. Just start working on your idea immediately. Um, and then build it fast and iterate on it. So just like in many other technology fields with the prototyping, like in games, you think about building a game and building a prototype, getting it out there, getting people's reactions. Do the same thing with a business idea. Um, even if it's just talking to people and maybe come up with lots of them until you've whittled it down to the one that really resonates with people. And then find great co-founders. I, uh, I definitely, um, I didn't, understand the concept of co-founders when I got started. I had really great mentors and advisors that we considered co-founders, but the difference was they weren't really co-founders because they didn't get in there and dive into it day to day with me every day. So when it came down to it and it was like, oh my God, how are we gonna make payroll next week? They were getting paid by some 
other job, right, or some other payroll, and it wasn't their full-time responsibility. Once you've dived in and this is where you're actually making your living from, if you have a co-founder, you want them to also have taken that same level of responsibility on. If they haven't, they're probably an advisor. Um, and that was a lesson I learned after the fact. <laughs> um, and also, I think that the best pairs there tend to be, and I've just seen this sort of, I haven't yet experienced it, but I've seen this in other companies, a technical founder, somebody who really understands maybe the product side of it, and a more business-oriented founder. That just seems like a pair that generally works together. You have a mutual respect for what each other can do. Um, Send to check the market opportunity, and that just kind of goes back to our initial sort of not really looking at it. We were a little skewed in how we were viewing the market. You know, if you really want ultimately to grow a business, you need to find a business opportunity where you can make money. Um, think big, dream big. So we were a little scared of the idea of thinking too big. We weren't in Silicon Valley. We weren't in the heart of games. We didn't really want to try to compete with these big players because it was kind of scary. Um, that meant we were too niche, really. Um, so it's okay to kind of go after a big vision and then find a niche within that vision to get started with. Um, so sort of the opposite of sort of how we did it is how I'd recommend doing it from the start. Uh, and then it is definitely this roller coaster of a ride, and that's totally normal. Um, and I think that was a great lesson learned for me early on is that it, you're going to hit the bottom and you're going to be like, oh my god, we're closing down next week, I know it. Um, and then the next day you're like, this is going to be the next big thing and it's going to totally make it. <laughs> and sometimes that's an hour apart. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, it's rocky. And, but I think knowing that that is a normal thing and that other people, every founder you talk to is going to tell you, like, that's how your life goes and it's, you just get used to it. If you expect it and you know it's normal, then you can stay positive through it and you can feel sort of that down piece and stick with it, not say, well, give, you know, I'm throwing my hands up and I'm quitting. Um, and then my last one, this is I'm just starting to figure this one out, is you've just really got to have fun with what you're doing. So staying focused, stay determined. I'm sure everybody kind of knows that. And it's not that hard when it's your own thing. But having fun along the way is a key thing. And so if you can take these times to do things that you think are just really fun, a lot of times you'll find that they actually resonate and work for the company that you're building. And so the more fun things I've done, the more it's sort of you know, turned it th into things that have worked really well for us as a company. Um, and I'm just starting to kind of understand that now. So you know, be sure that you're enjoying what you're doing. It's really neat when you get to work up, wake up and work on your thing every day, whatever it is. So I think I, I have about five or 10 minutes left. Um, so I'm going to take that time to talk a bit about Wild Pockets and then answer any questions on either subject at the end. Uh, entrepreneurship, obviously, is something I really am passionate about. And I really believe that it's very accessible, um, more so than people sort of realize. And you know, going after your dreams is, is definitely something everybody should experience at one point. Um, and it is that journey that, that's meaningful. And it's sort of that experience that will teach you other things that you couldn't learn in other ways. Um, so the product that we're building actually kind of it segues well into sort of the same concept. Um, we've really built a platform that's about opening up and making accessible this world of, of game development to small independent teams of developers. So be it somebody in their garage, somebody has, does it as a hobby, or maybe it's somebody who wants to experiment with how games can be used for teaching or training. Um, but one way or another, we wanted a platform that allowed you to create really quality experiences, really um, immersive, you know, the full 3D experiences that you see in sort of polished games, uh, but to do it as a, a team of one, maybe two, maybe three. Um, so the first thing we did was, uh, and this was kind of really derived from that early work in the university, same kinds of ideas, um, and especially this beginning process. So we looked at what does it take to build and publish and be successful? As with any game, and then especially with a 3D game. And I'm um, going to keep using the term game, but you can imagine applying this to anything interactive. Um, so the first thing, you've got your idea. And that's kind of you know, the developer's responsibility, not our responsibility. You come up with your great idea. But then you're thinking about, what am I going to build this on? So what does it cost? How hard is it to learn? You know, how, much, you know, how many other people are using it? How many features? There's a lot of questions that go into that. Um, then you're thinking about, especially in 3D, I've got to build all this content. I've got to build 3D models, sound effects, maybe animations. I've got to put in you know, the textures that co cover the 3D models. I've got to uh, put in sound effects. I've got to write the interactivity for this. So there's this ton of work in that building assets 
space. Then you're going to test it. You're going to maybe use or test it. And then you're going to go through that cycle a few more times. So just that alone is like, I don't think I could do that in a weekend. <laughs> Probably not as a hobby. Um, then I want to publish it. So now I'm thinking about where can I publish it without constraints and sort of publishing requirements and different sort of you know, assessments done and time um, and also a huge competitive market. Where can I publish this um, that I have control over? Uh, or potentially not, but at least plan in that I might take weeks before my thing is launched. Um, distributing and marketing it, a lot of times independent developers really haven't thought a lot about how they're going to get the word out there about the content they've created. Um, monetize it is definitely an afterthought for a lot of independent, especially game developers, is they built the game and now they got it out there and they're like, oh, I should make some money on this. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I'll just stick some advertising in and you know, do it as a pre-roll or something. But you don't make a ton of money that way. It's actually been going down. Um, and then the very last thing is like, hey, it's been out there and people have been playing it. I wonder how many people are playing it. Hi, I should have maybe put some analytics in. <laughs> and I should know, you know, what are people actually doing? Could I make this better? Um, so a lot of these are afterthoughts and they're sort of out of the realm of expertise of, I have a great concept, I want to make it happen. Um, so our thinking in building out our platform was, let's take away a lot of this hard stuff so we can open it up and make it more accessible to an independent developer. And we know there's a market for it. Um, and actually, in the last two years, it's been exploding. It's the Facebook and iPhone market, right? There's all these people out there spending weekends just coding up small things and releasing them. And really quality games have started to come out, especially on the iPhone. Um, in Facebook, they've showed there's a huge monetization opportunity. But I argue that there's a long way to go still before the quality of the game gets to something that's like what we've seen in sort of the console and more traditional space. Um, so that's an exciting kind of window that there's going to be, I think, a lot of movement in, in the coming years is where do these things start intersecting? So what we're trying to do with the Wild Pockets platform is really pull together this development environment that takes away all of the hassles of developing a full 3D game, um, giving the developers a means to distribute and monetize this in the places that are growing, so places like the web, places like the social networks, um, and at the same time integrating them into a community that can help them build it more quickly. So much like how Silicon Valley has, for me, been a resource in building a company more quickly, I think the same thing can happen in the game development space, um, and often does happen. So this is um, uh, a quick picture of just our development environment and um, I'm going to go through very quickly sort of all of the pieces here but this is probably of all of them the most important one to kind of understand is we've built the whole thing around the concept of a shareable marketplace or library and that's what fundamentally speeds up the process the most. Uh, you can leverage people's existing assets, so be it 3D models or templates or existing code, um, and use that when building your own game. So a lot of this right now in the game space is used over and over again. People reinvent the wheel all the time, creating a mechanic that somebody else has already created for another game, even though their game is quite different. So the whole concept is providing this sort of user-generated, crowdsourced, um, development marketplace where you can come to and search for things that might speed up your process um, or at least get you to the prototype much faster. Uh, and everything is in the browser. It's all full 3D in the browser um, and it's open and free to use for anyone. The community section is really key to this so we um, actually imagine that because it is cloud hosted we can do a lot more collaborative features um, over the course of time around communities and developers working together to build these games and connecting to each other remotely. Um, the distribution and hosting, because it is all in the cloud and live already, you basically press save and you've got a URL and an embed tag where you can now distribute this anywhere on the web, a social network, your website, a blog, etc. And we're working on a uh, series of distribution partner sites where the best of the games we can bring to to help them market and distribute them. And the final piece, and very important piece, is the uh, analytics system and the monetization system. So instead of having to go and find one of these systems and integrate them and work on kind of all of this programming that's not necessarily the core of the game, we've given the infrastructure in place. So the same place you're building the game mechanics, you might say like this object equals 10 coins. And that's as far as you have to do on a development side. We've taken care of all of the other underlying uh, hard work in the infrastructure 
And you can, at that point, once your game is live, go to your dashboard and check the sales and see what's going on within your game. And even more important, to make sure you've built the game so that it is monetizing, you need to be able to track what's going on. Are players even you know, getting to this level in the game? Are they even interested in this object? Um, and tweak it in real time. So the analytics is also built in and you can add in custom t tags just as easily as you can price content. Again, just right within the script of your game without having to go find some system to integrate. So last, uh, last piece here. Um, we're just in a very early beta at this point, but um, we've already seen developers starting to gravitate to this idea. Um, we have you know, lots of work to do on sort of product and development environment, but we're really optimistic about kind of how this all comes together. Um, we've seen really amazing people starting to adopt this. And uh, final one, just for anybody who's interested in looking at what we're doing, wildpockets.com, and feel free to email me. Um, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about either. I'm equally passionate about sort of the idea of, of people starting companies and also people creating their own game companies or games. So thank you. Thanks very much, Shanna. I'm sure that we're going to have plenty of questions, so I'll open the floor first, right at the back. Uh, when you thought about the idea of uh, starting your own company, I'm assuming you shared this idea with your friends and relatives. How supportive they were in your uh, idea? Mom? <laughs> <laughs> My mom actually is in the audience here. So, um, I actually, you know, I think people are pretty, pretty open to it. They don't really understand what you're doing, but at the same time, nobody discouraged, nobody said, don't do that. Um, so I think that people were more kind of curious <laughs> as to how this whole thing was going to play out and thought, well, you know, if in a couple of months it doesn't work out, no big deal. Like, I go get another job or something. Um, I don't think anybody expected that this would turn into like four years of me <laughs> building this business. Um, but yeah, I think, it, I think, you know, it was helpful to not have anybody going, don't do that. <laughs> All right. Shannon, do you think that uh, you can teach someone to be an entrepreneur? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not sure yes and no. So I think that the, I, the passion behind an idea is something that you have to have, right? There has to be something that you just really want to do. And that's the like internal piece. And then I think the mechanics of like how you go about setting up a business, that's very teachable. Um, and I think that's, that's kind of that experience piece, right? You can work with people who've done it before who can sort of help walk you through the ropes and you're probably going to make a bunch of your own mistakes as well, but at least guide you a bit. Um, but I think the sort of ability to be energized around some idea and be optimistic around it even when there's challenges involved is something that's got to come from internally. I think Mona would be doing it. Yeah, how did you um, go about finding your team? Who were they and how did you get to know them? Um, so actually the very first person from my team had worked with me. He was an artist from uh, Carnegie Mellon and he was in the Entertainment Technology Center and had just sort of stayed involved with this project as it spun out. And um, so when I got this contract, he was sort of the natural person to bring in. And another one was um, a student at Carnegie Mellon who'd come out from computer science and we needed a programmer and I had like three days and asked everybody I knew to send me resumes <laughs> and met him and he was just like very excited about the whole idea and I, he was really smart and really excited and I was like, that's it, that's all I need. <laughs> and, um, and he's been there for four years. Um, and, uh, and then everybody else has sort of trickled in that same way, either has been recommended, sometimes we've gotten resumes um, and then, you know, I try to have multiple people on our team interview and, um, and other advisors interview as well. But, does seem like a network is the most useful way to recruit. Although we've had one really random hire most recently where it was just literally posted on the web uh, for in the Drupal community for our web developer and found like this incredibly perfect fit who just happened to be moving from Japan to Pittsburgh. <laughs> like, <laughs> when things like that happen, you're like, wow. <laughs> like the stars aligned. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, Ms. Ante, thanks. Uh, yes, <laughs> um, hi, uh, you say you come from a fine art background. Um, I'm a fine art student and I guess I've never considered business to be something I was interested in because it seems quite cold and money oriented and removed from the creative process. So did, did it take you a while to shift from one perspective to the other or 
did you quite quickly realize that there were all these <coughs> symbiotic relationships that you could work with? Yeah, I mean, I think that art school prepares you in all kinds of ways you don't expect, like the critiques you go through are the most grueling things, you know? I mean, they're basically like, everything you just did sucks. <laughs> and I mean, business is not going to be worse. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I mean, that was actually good training. And also being able to sort of present your ideas clearly and uh, speak about your work is like traits that you don't even think about that translate into business. I think the money piece of it has been the hardest piece for me to sort of get used to is, um, and I'm still not quite good at it, which is, you know, framing things in a way as like, you're going to make a lot of money if you come and work with me. I really much more enjoy like, here's what our idea is about, and here's the vision behind it. Um, and that attracts a certain number of people, but some people are like, no, 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 just tell me how, how is this going to make money? Um, so that's been a hard transition. And how does it make money? What's that? And how does it make money? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, so there is, our primary business model is we have this transaction engine that's embedded and a lot like actually the iPhone model, we take a percentage of all the transactions that occur. So the developer keeps the majority of the revenue, but we kind of on the back end take a percentage of that. So that can be either marketplace transactions, so the assets that developers use if they choose to sell them, um, but also the bigger market is really for the games as they go out there to players and they have sales in the games, virtual goods and other items that get sold. We're taking a percentage of those sales because we've provided sort of all that infrastructure. Um, that's, the, that's one of the ones we encourage the most because we just see it as the biggest opportunity moving forward for independent developers. Um, the other one, if you, play, if you want a free to play game and you don't want to deal with the store or your game doesn't really fit in that mold, um, we do have sort of the ability to have a pre-roll um, ad network and then the final one, and this is kind of for everybody who's thinking about maybe more educational uses or um, maybe even marketing uses and doesn't want any business model in there, uh, at that point we, can, we charge a hosting fee that only starts when there's a certain amount of bandwidth. So you can have very small projects that are totally free on the platform. And we never make a dime and we encourage that because we really want that innovation. But if they start to kind of grow and somebody's now attracting large audiences and there's a lot of users coming in, we have a scalable um, hosting model and, and you just pay basically a fee like as if it was your website. Okay, do you need to go to the back? So, um, Philip, this is for like Geeks Anonymous. I'm Karen and I have an iPod game. <laughs> um, and the problem with that was trying to find an artist because I'm a computer scientist and I know loads of programmers. So I wondered how you were getting around that in Wild Pockets of pairing together the artists and the creative sides with the more technical sides. Yeah, um, actually that's one of the really cool things that we're trying to do in this community. Um, and that's not uncommon, right? And, and it's not uncommon to want to make a game and to not necessarily have all the skills you need to make a game. So one is just kind of access to this library. So one is you could make it and just pick pieces out of there. The other one is because it's sort of built around this community, you have a user profile, you might find an artist's style that you like, and you can connect to them right in the community and sort of get in touch with them and maybe see if you might collaborate on a project. And we're actually right now thinking about ideas that might be sort of this like, you know, a little bit of a matchmaking service or like a call out basically where you're saying, hey, I'm looking for an artist for this project. Anybody interested? And somebody can respond to you. So we're using a lot of sort of these um, social networking features um, in a really interesting way that we hadn't thought a lot about when we built this cloud hosted. Um, but it's really cool because it's like taking all these things like status updates and sort of, you know, ability to sort of like, you know, tweet or kind of in real time reach out to people and applying them to a very specific focus, which is building games. So if you come to our site, you'll see these uh, people are always updating their statuses, which we thought was so strange. It's like they're on Facebook or something, but they're on a software platform. And I'd never seen a software platform where people update their status, you know, <laughs> it's just a strange concept. But if you think about it, there's ways you can apply that. Or now if somebody can say, I just launched this. Can somebody beta test this? Or like, hey, I'm working on this. Can somebody help me? But it's a focused community. So you know everybody else there is also building games. OK, Jackie. Can I just ask you? In terms of running your business, and I think you've been fantastic at describing the ups and downs <laughs> that happens in business that we've all experienced, but in terms of investors, as a creative person at any point, did you think you just didn't want anyone else to take the control of the company away from you? Um, I haven't actually struggled with that. I think because the investors that we've worked with they don't drive the creative direction of the product. They really look to me and our team to help 
as the experts around this field and around this technology, the pieces that they help with is shaping the business model and thinking about you know how do we grow it and how do we fund it. Um, and then in terms of ownership, like you know, people oftentimes think about how much ownership they have in the company. And you know, the best advice I ever got was, if it's a big idea, then ultimately, you know, the ownership you have is not going to matter. You really want the right people around the table, no matter what they end up open, owning in the company. So that's never been something I worried about, and and I haven't actually struggled with them influencing too much what we're working on. And I can imagine that would be a bad scenario, but I think we've just worked with really, really great investors. <laughs> I'd like to ask a question about your vision, Yeah. what your vision is for maybe the next five to seven years and whether you've got an exit strategy. Sure. Um, so I think the first vision is uh, get the next round of funding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's always kind of the next piece. Um, we're right now at that you know, point where we have built all of our infrastructure and really need to kind of launch it to that next stage of polish and it's hard to do with such a small team. So <laughs> we're trying to figure out kind of how to balance all of that. Um, but ultimately, I hope that this becomes sort of an innovation you know, community, like something that everybody from different disciplines, artists and sound designers, and we've had all these people coming to us, and programmers and maybe educational institutions, people looking at serious games, are coming to it because it just is really accessible, really friendly, really easy. Um, and because there's a thriving community, they know they can get help from. Um, so that's, I'd like this to be kind of the center of independent development. Mm -hmm. um, as an exit strategy, I mean, I think there's lots of opportunities in this space, uh, and they're all kind of converging. I mean, there's, you know, major companies like Microsoft and Google, and they've all got products that sort of span sort of gaming and, and software, as well as kind of the social community interactions. Um, then there's kind of on the more software side, there's, you know, Autodesk and, and more traditional software and Adobe who are thinking right now a little bit about where is software going um, as the next generation? So I think those are all potential exits, but it, it does feel pretty far off at mm -hmm. the moment. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, one last question. How big is your team? You keep talking about it being small. I'm just curious what that means. To yeah, you. sure. So we've got, um, and this is now, we started with you know, me and this one artist around my kitchen table. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so now we're at about 12 people, um, and some are not full-time yet, but we have a uh, six-person engineering team, and we have um, one, you know, one senior level, you know, PhD, incredibly experienced engineer, um, and then a lot of really talented, really smart, sort of younger en engineers, uh, and then we have a web art team, so um, a team with, you know, 3D modeling and also just art, kind of graphic design skills, um, a web engineer, and then um, one artist who's an engineer who kind of spans it all. And then myself and a uh, and one woman who really helps me with everything else that goes on in the company, kind of PR, marketing, everything you can imagine. Um, and the two of us sort of take the brunt of the rest of the world. <laughs> okay. I'd just like to thank um, Shanna very much for, for coming to join us tonight. Um, I hope that your trip around the rest of Scotland, I hope you actually get to see something yeah. with the rest of your time <laughs> here. I'm so glad that it's been filled with fantastic opportunities for your business and to talk mm -hmm. to people about it. Um, so I'd like to just... Thank you very much. Thank you.